All right. Well, we've had uh, a fun night here on Liberty Radio so far. So uh, why not just go ahead and keep getting uh, backed up harder? What do you say, Yona? Oh, yeah. That, that's right, folks. It's happened once already, and now it's happening again. It's Get Back Harder with Colonel Drizzle and Major High Yona. That's right. Uh, you know, I, I had pointed out earlier during the potluck um, uh, that there were uh, two <laughs> phrases, as I recall, one in German and one in Spanish. And the uh, German word of the night was um, Tördlich. Uh, and, of course, uh, in the German language, Auf Deutsch, bitte schön, uh, Tördlich means deadly. So... If you happen to be around some German speakers and you hear them talking about a bunch of turd lake stuff, deadly shit. And and as Drizzle rightly pointed out, turd licking is deadly itself. So it makes perfect sense. And and it does make sense as well. Um, and then the Spanish uh, phrase, or castellano, for those that prefer the other term, um, I think it was Recibo de la Luz. Yes. Recibo de la Luz. Uh, which means electric bill. And, and as I did correctly point out before the power outage, <laughs> just because you pay for your electric bill, <laughs> don't expect it to be on all the time. Lower your expectations. And that, and that brings us up to speed here, Drizzle. Pretty much. Yeah. Except I'm, I'm still not exactly sure why the power went out you know I, I don't think it was one of those things where maybe it had to happen uh, maybe it was uh maybe it was made to happen you know well it turns out that one of the dynamos that's powering the acapulco um power plant mm -hmm. is actually one of those mariachi players with the big sombrero <laughs> and he has the soccer ball in his hat and so long as he keeps the soccer ball orbiting his sombrero, power stays on. But he had to stop from scratch. Yeah. So well, here's here was the there interesting thing about it, right? Like the building behind me, they had power, right? And like the the street lights were all on, right? And the building on the other side of me here, they had power. Matter of fact, there was a light on in the apartment on the other side of this building, uh, but I didn't have power. So, huh. yeah. Maybe, so, so in other words, maybe there's somebody down in the breaker box fucking with you. Yeah. Well, what I was told is there was a short in the line, right? And, and I was showed what appeared to be a, a burn up uh, electrical wire. Uh, and for 500 pesos, my power came back on. Oh, uh, yeah. So, so there was a there was a two short in the line, and it said "bitch." Yeah, yeah. It happens all the time. It's really bad in Oakland these times. Yeah. <laughs> That's all wow. right. We already have the solution to that problem. So, yeah, it is what and, it is. And for those that are keeping track. These days, 500 pesos is worth, I'm going to say, probably about 120 bucks. No. No. It's not five pesos to the dollar? No. No. It is probably, because it's been a while since I've had to look. It's probably about 17 to 1. 16 or 17 to 1. Yeah. Wow! It was about twenty to one when I got here. So the wow. the peso has improved in the time that I've been here. Oh yeah, it was. Um, oh my god! Well, you know what? It's uh, like twenty twenty fourteen twenty fifteen. It happened something like that. The peso crashed. Note to post production: We need to give a big old eggplant emoji to the Mexican peso right about now. Yeah, there's no post production on this. And, and all about? you get, we don't have that kind of budget. The, uh, 
All you get for the American dollar is the banana peel. It's the mm. limp banana peel emoji. But, you know, fortunately, all that means is, hey, gringos, get down to Mexico and you can shop 24-7 at the OXO and get those cheap fucking cigarettes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what and I then, went up to OXO uh, this afternoon, and I got uh, milk, and I got yogurt, and I got uh, cheese and eggs, and I spent less than ten bucks for all of it. For all of it, yep. You can't even get a pack of cigarettes for less than ten dollars, hardly anything. I believe it. Um, That's one of the reasons I quit though, smoking. In I Mexico, saw all of that coming. Totally yeah. And the best part of all, they got that pozo. That pozo. Mm. It, it, oh my God. It's like this indigenous um, chalky cocoa drink type thing. There's different versions of the pozo. And I also recommend if you're going to do the horchata, go for the white horchata and not the red horchata. The white horchata with the, the canela. I'm sorry. Uh, Cinnamon. Uh, oh, my God. Man, they got some really, you know. And then Mexico has these other kind of drinks I'm going to call alcoholic drinks. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. All Americans know about those, don't they? No, they Pink don't. Blood, they really don't. Margaritas, daiquiris. They think they know. All, all you've ever had is Unidenses, Green Ghosts. All you've ever gotten to taste is a simulacrum of the real thing. J- just a, a poor fake substitute that somewhat resembles in taste and look and feel the actual true experience of shit that's literally shit from the ass of an agave worm. But I'm telling you, man, Jonas pro tip, when in Mexico, always go for the mess. That's M E. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's called. It's like a brown tequila. It's like mm-hmm. it's like bourbon and tequila fucked. I had a love child. Yeah, that's accurate. I would say that's accurate. It's fucking amazing. And it's good. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. I will miss that. I will miss the food. Um. Bebidas, comidas frescas, mm-hmm. mercados, frutos, mm. todo el día y todo la noche. Y las mujeres. Precios, baratos, <laughs> por el tabaco y todo. <laughs> oh, man. But I'll be in but Texas. But on the other hand, so. on the other hand, you know, um, electricity is optional. So, you know, for those that want to try out living off grid but aren't ready to go all the way look about a about a three week stay in Mexico and you'll get to see whether you're ready for off grid yet what, what what do you mean the water's turned off oh but they're turning it on later today when they get done replacing the cobblestones in the street because they don't have black top here anyways uh, when is the power going to be turned back on Oh, they had to find another mule to pull the wheel. Yeah, all right. Oh, they got another mule. So, so pretty soon. Awesome. Great. So, you know, expatting is good. You just got to be careful where you expat. And as for those that are not aware, expat, that's uh, short for um, expatriate, I believe. Um, mm-hmm. Which is the, you know, because, you know, for example, if you're not an American and you go to live or work some other country you're an alien you're an immigrant but if you're an american and you go and live to work or you know you go to move some other country to live and work you're not an immigrant you're an expat and you know oftentimes there's entire whole ass expat communities or as they're called in latin america literally gringolandia there's gringolandia in mexico and Costa Rica, and uh, there may be a few in El Salvador, but not as many. Not as many in El Salvador, after all. Um, you know, 
there's a few in Guatemala, several in Belize, and a uh, shit ton of them in Ecuador. Ecuador is a major expat destination. Um, and these expat communities, uh, I mean, some of them are like literally the size of a small city in the United States. Uh, nothing but Americans. I mean, it, it's staggering how many... It, it, it's 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 mind blowing how many hundreds of thousands of Americans have already moved out of the United States hmm. and permanently live outside. Of and most of them are the pensioner class because with the fixed income, they're actually able to live on their fixed income, yep. a, a decent life in you know far off places like you know um, Zihuatanejo, mm-hmm. Mexico. These tapa and these other fucking little resort gringo landias that they literally Mexicans yeah. went down on the fucking beach and just built in, in a in a couple weeks and blams you want to nail. Yeah, even I, mean, uh, I think part of Vallarta <laughs> actually has a really large expat community, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm sure the the resort cities on the eastern side do as well. That wouldn't oh, yeah. surprise me at all. Around Veracruz, Tom Pico, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then particularly now, the hot spot is all around, you know, Campeche and Quintana Roo states with, mm-hmm. you know, Tulum and Chichen Itza and, you know, the whole Mayan playa there, Cancun, Isla de, uh, de la Cozumel, you know. Cozumel and Cancun have already been spring break hotspots for decades. And now, uh, you know, I'm, one of the probably the most controversial acts, I think, of uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador, or AMLO for short, uh, mm. Mexico's president, current president, would be the Tren Maya, which is this uh, Mayan train standard gauge rail which a lot of the track had already been laid and used but then abandoned later and you know to give just a brief uh, historical context the mayan coast like from cancun down to uh uh chetumal which is the capital city of quintana Roo, right next to belize that's the mexican frontier those were the last states to be added to the mexican republic in the 1900s. Um, hmm. And so that was still a wild frontier in the 20th fucking century with, you know, loincloth wearing Mayan Indians still diving through cenotes, fighting the Mexican federales in the 1920s for their independence, which they didn't get. Um, and instead, my kind of people. One of the estados of los 33 estados mexicanos. Because there's 33 states in the Mexican Republic now. 33 states. Um, And two of those are uh, part of the Cancun megaplex of tourism now. Then, uh, you know, full disclosure, I have been to the Hard Rock Cafe Cancun. um, But I didn't buy a t-shirt. Do you have the shirt to prove it, though? That's the question. No. I said fuck it. You know, I... I mean, even at one time, I'll be the first to admit, I actually did have a members-only jacket. But... I mean, I thought it was required if you lived in the United States in the 1980s. Like, wasn't it written into law? I had a puppy, and I'd given it anti or dewormer pills and while I was holding the puppy wearing my members only jacket it pooped out the worms onto the jacket and so I threw away that members only jacket early into the fad and uh, luckily I replaced it with uh, one of those awesome aviator leather jackets remember when those were the fucking thing oh yeah 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 the movie had Pearl Harbor had come out with Ben Affleck, and it was, you know, it's the rage again. Um, uh, and <laughs> funny story, I ended up getting dog shit on that one. So I'm, 
Worms took out one jacket. Dog worms got one jacket. Dog shit got another. Um, but you know, I miss my dogs. I, 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 I do miss. You know, I. You can replace jackets. You can't replace the fur babies. But. That's true. That is true. Speaking of dogs, uh, Amlo, the the aforementioned uh, El Presidente. Uh, of the Mexican Confederation or whatever it is. Um, he's going to be gone soon because his, his, his term is going to be up or, or, what, or however they do it. I don't know how they do it down I here. Know. Maybe they just come and tap him on the shoulder. I don't know. Um, but Well, actually, at the end of their term, they're tied into a tree like a piñata, yeah. And all the new candidates get to swing a stick, and if they hit him in the right spot, candy falls out of his ass. But anyway, <laughs> that's how they do it in Mexico. Well, his replacement, uh, or at least the person that they think is going to be uh, elected by the people, right, uh, to be his successor, um, is if elected she would be not only the first female Mexican president, she would also be the first Jewish Mexican president. I think oh, ever, like in the history of ever, I don't think there's ever been a female Jewish Mexican president of anything before. No. No. Yeah, so that's like a world record. That's like a world history world world record. Like you can't you can't top that. She's like the first ever to do that. And maybe the last. Who knows? Cuz things are looking bleak. <laughs> like that's going to be a difficult one to top. A female Jewish Mexican president. The only thing that might top that right is uh like a female iranian uh uh no see i can't even i can't even like pull it out of my ass i was going for like a pope right like the most ridiculous pope you could think of but i couldn't i couldn't even do it like i couldn't write the joke that's how absurd this I, is i got you one better a self-made billionaire hot dog, female hot dog vendor from Saudi Arabia <laughs> that becomes Saudi Arabia's first female leader. Hmm. Made her fortune selling not halal beef wieners and became Saudi Arabia's first female leader. And at last, ladies were allowed to drive. Thanks to the sale of Wiener. Thank you. <laughs> Long live the kingdom. Anyway. Mm. Uh, you know, how, uh, did you catch that, uh, what was it, Brett Bayer, Fox News? The, uh, the tongue, um, the, the, the licking interview where he was licking Mohammed bin Salman in a very loving and nurturing fashion. Uh, <laughs> for the, I mean, we're talking about the leader of well the, 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 the ruling prince yeah. of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, none other than uh Mohammed bin Salman. Um and he was interviewed by Brett Bayer um in English and uh MBS Mohammed bin Salman MBS uh speaks to English and gave you know whole interviews in English and so you I mean he should he's saying. of uh British descent so um and as Richard Medhurst rightly pointed out in this interview um uh, you know at, you know they always want to noodle and poke uh Saudi Arabia about Iran you know it's typical nemesis and of course there's been a a diplomatic uh as the French call it, rapprochement uh, between Iran and uh, Arabi Saudi, and and you know the the Saudis and 
be, being primarily uh, Sunni and Wahhabi and other things, and Iran being Persians rather than Arabs, and being of the Shia persuasion, you know, have been at odds for the longest time, but uh, they now have reestablished diplomatic ties and everything. But of course, there's still a bit of uh, uh, love loss between the two, at least on the part of the Saudis, because, you know, when uh, Brett Bayer kept pressing the point to MBS about what we'll have, uh, and what about when Iran gets nukes? But what about if Iran gets nukes? And he's like, man, you know, I, nukes aren't really a good weapon to have. I mean, if you get the nuke and you go to use it and you kill 100,000 people, now you're, you're at war with the entire world. So it's like a weapon you can't use. You know, there are other u- weapons that are far more useful that you actually can use. And so I don't understand. It's, well, what if Iran did get a nuke? Well, obviously, if Iran did get a nuke, then we would have to go into it. You know, just to balance the power of the Middle East, uh, you know, so that they're not the only nuclear power in the Middle East. And I'm like, okay. Now, MBS and Brett Payer and the whole goddamn studio is gaslighting everybody because... <clears throat> Demona. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, okay, so there was this guy named Jonathan Pollard, you see. And he was American. Slash Mossad spy. And worked at a nuclear facility in the United States. Pull that mic forward just a little bit. Yeah, so this Jonathan Pollard guy. There you go. American. Slash Mossad agent. Working at the American nuclear facility there. Smuggled away all the secrets to Demona Israel to make nuky weapons. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we caught him at it red handed. And he was put in jail for like a however many life sentences. But don't worry, folks, there's a happy ending to this story. Out of our undying love for God's chosen people, the Israelis. We let Jonathan Pollard go back to Israel. Mm -hmm. He's been reformed. And as for the nuclear weapons that Israel then made with the secrets that were stolen from the United States. Wait a second. No, I didn't say any of that. Israel totally doesn't have a nuclear weapons program at all. Never mind. Moving on. (laughs) <laughs> and that's how the whole world treats it. The UN and everybody. Yeah, the UN Everybody especially. knows that they have it and nobody knows because, you know, the IAEA is just a tool of Mossad and the Israelis to spy on every other nuclear program in the world that's competing mm-hmm. with theirs that doesn't exist that everybody knows exists and pretends it doesn't exist. Yeah, and sabotage the people that they don't like. <laughs> yeah. and, and then strangely enough, so as Richard Meadows pointed out, the Saudis would be worried about Iran having nuclear weapons because that would upset the balance of power in the greater Levant. But the fact that the Zionists got nukies, not a, not a problem. Because, you know, the, it, Israel's fucked with every one of their neighbors except Saudi Arabia. Because they do touch Saudi Arabia at the Gulf of Aqaba. That's A Q A B A, Aqaba. Yeah, but nobody messes with Saudi Arabia. Nobody. Like, well, and, and you know, and they're like fact, the Switzerland of, of the Middle East. If you think about it, they're they're kind of like twins in a way. They're they're they're, they're peas from the same pod, because. Just as Lawrence of Arabia launched the Sauds and the royal Sauds family coming to, and they helped create their own country for them and carve it out. Same thing with the Zionists, the Balfour Declaration. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, go back to, to uh, several Grand Theft World podcasts for more information about uh, the initial settlement of Palestine long before the Kibbutzes. It goes back to the early early 19th century. That's 1800s. Yep. Yeah. Anyway. Anywho, um, you know, I mean, you know, one man's Haganahs, another man's Mossad, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Just different time eras. One man's OSS, another man's CIA, and then Downing Street joins in, and it's just one big bukkake of um, Anglo-American um, lovemaking. There you go. 
Like like porting down in the scribbles. <laughs> and why did they have to kill the animals? You know, I mean, why not? Anyways, I, I'm not going to go down this. Well, it's uh, like the the cops, right? They don't have to shoot the dogs most of the time. They just do. Yeah, because like, uh, they can. Didn't that happen at Ruby Bridge with the sniper guy, Len Horiuchi? When he's firing mm. on the and he, and he he shot the guy's wife and and killed mm-hmm. the family dog, that yeah that was Ruby Ridge yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. America's greatest hits I'm telling you we go through all of them. <laughs> you know I I still haven't seen the latest greatest um docu movie or whatever you want to call it that they made of uh, David Koresh and the Branch Davidian compound and. Janet Reno giving the order to, for the ATF to go in there and um, burn all those people alive. You know, a funny story. Um, and who can re- forget Janet Reno tugging on one side of baby Alien from Cuba? Remember that thing? Oh my God. Alien I all about that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I just can't go with Janet Reno and not do the whole thing. You know, I mean, and I look back on these stories now from the point of manufacturing reality mm-hmm. and the whole zeitgeist of propaganda. And, you know, it was actually better. You know, the, 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 they, they took the babies out of the incubators and threw them on the cold, hard floor. Hey, yeah. I'm going to give credit where it's due. That was some pretty good acting, man. Those are some pretty fire ass lines, man. I look back on it by comparing it to today's propaganda. Mm. That was like usable cow shit that you find in the field. Fuck, there might even be mushrooms on that stuff compared to the dog shit we're served today. You know, and, and it's gotten so bad that independent media, independent content creators have really been cutting into the general populace so much so that we're seeing an intensification of the infiltration of the independent media space not just in the chats not just with trolls and haters and stuff but across the spectrum um and it's kind of ubiquitous because a lot of people are not necessarily an off in any way it's called self-censoring. You mm-hmm. know, and you're like, well, I'm going to save this for the other part of the stream that I do on Rumble or whatever, but since we're on YouTube, uh, we're, we're going to use our special code words. And, you know, whenever you start to play that game of self-censorship, I'd like to think, you know, you're killing a little part of yourself. A little part of you dies every time you self-censor, you know. Thinking of your career instead of your principles, and people will tell me, "Man, you got to live. You know, you got to make a living, man." You know, I'm saying I was trying to make a living. I, you know, I don't want to starve. And I mean, that's well, yeah, but I guess that's um, the story of America. You know, at this point, man, I don't want to starve. I wouldn't take the shot, but I got to give it to all my patients, or I won't get my bonus every day. Yeah, that's the American way. That's right there. Yeah. First, do no harm to your career. Then cash your check. And uh, see you at the hospital tomorrow. Mm-hmm. That's, that's your new Hippocratic oath. Think of your career. Yeah. Well, I look, we've we've been <laughs> in. We're, we're two decades deep in the biosecurity state. Right. Yeah. Like we're not even we're not even balls deep anymore. We just fucking like we're like ankle deep at this point. And every year it gets a little bit worse. But well, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of Canada's um infamous uh Zim Zer proponent and a uh, musician and um, charismatic speaker. 
I don't know what what label do you use for Jordan Peterson. I'll just call Jordan Peterson a musician because he has put out songs, <laughs> some music videos, and uh, you I mean, can he listen is to it. Technically, a I would. professor, or right? Was right. And so you know, non sequiturs aside, <laughs> um. I think it was on Joe Rogan where Jordan Peterson basically described uh, the slow march to fascism as um, they come right up to you, get into your comfort zone, get you to back up one inch, and then they back off two inches. They get up in your face again, they back up another inch. And before you know it, you look down and they've already gotten you to just lower your expectations and back up. Mm-hmm or four feet next thing you know you've moved an entire next thing you know you've moved a bloody soccer pitch or however he wants to talk i mean you know it's uh uh didn't really prepare a uh jordan peterson parody voice for this point but you know um i like the way that he described the incrementalism and the pulsing nature of the creep of fascism in the United States and that they, they push it and then let back and then push it and then let back. Um, and I think, you know, obviously one of the greatest examples of that has got to be with um, uh, Michelle Lujan Grisham, governor of New Mexico, mm. with her unilateral declaration out of the Capitol in Santa Fe for Bernalillo County, which is where Albuquerque is the most populous city in the state. I think over a third of the population of all of new mexico lives in fucking duke town albuquerque bernalillo county as it were she just made this unilateral spontaneous declaration of um a health emergency because the child had been killed basically banning uh guns from everywhere and immediately uh you know writs were filed to the courts and certified and injunctions were raised, so in response, she modified her declaration to, well, just around playgrounds and schools. You're right. not allowed to have uh, that. And, and of all the places, it was when she was being interviewed by uh, CNN, shout out Ted Turner, um, you know, if you can't feed them, don't breed them. Don't have more than one child, says Ted Turner, who had, Seven, eight, nine, nine. ten kids. I, 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 st- I, I stopped counting when he went past eight. Yeah, and, and I'm up to eight now. And you know, I, I told the old lady <clears> once <throat> we get up to eight kids, I stopped counting. So eight is <clears throat> enough. But we can keep going. I'm <laughs> not counting anymore. Um, but anyways, uh, it was when Grisham was being uh, New Mexico Governor Grisham was being interviewed on CNN. She's like, well. You know, you being a lawyer and everything, don't you? Do you think this meets constitutional muster? Hmm. He's like, well, we'll see. We'll see. You know, it's in the court. We'll see. Uh, and she's like, after all, you know, con- your oath to. And, and, you know, now this is when she was uh, asked a question when she made the first declaration when she was in Santa Fe by a local reporter there. I said, well, what about your oath to the Constitution? You know, and, and our and our rights. And, and she essentially said, well, uh, my oath isn't absolute. Our rights aren't absolute. You know, we put restrictions on rights all the time. Yeah. And, 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 you know, th- this is not a ban. This is just a suspension hmm. of gun rights for an emergency. A health so, emergency. like, so was, she, was she expecting... A, this is the part that I never understood, right? She she instituted what was in effect a gun ban, right? You're not allowed to have and carry a gun, uh, basically, period. In because the governor the, said so. Because the governor All said so, right? In in like reason. yeah, you, there's we're drawing a line on the map, and that's a no gun zone according to the governor, because right. the whatever. Um, what about the people that lived in that area that owned guns legally and lawfully before she had her little hissy fit tantrum, right? 
Oh, uh, that funny were story. they supposed to just like, I, that's what I didn't understand. Were they supposed to turn in their guns? Were they supposed to drive them out of the county? What were they supposed to do? Oh, no, she had stipulations for keeping them in a lockbox or keeping them in a gun cabinet, uh, but you can't. And if you travel with them, they have to be in a gun lock and, or trigger and all this stuff. Well, of course, an immediate response to that. The very county in question where Albuquerque is located at the center of this debate, Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office said, well, there's no way to enforce this uh, unilateral declaration by the governor because it's completely unconstitutional. Uh, and then the other sheriff's departments across New Mexico reiterated the same thing. And then the New Mexico Attorney General came out and said, there's no way we can prosecute anyone for violating the Lateral declaration of the governor because it's unconstitutional. Um, articles of impeachment have been brought forth in Santa Fe by uh, two Republicans, I think. But Santa Fe is that's the New Mexico state government is uh, completely fucking shit lit dominated in their state legislature. So it's I kid man, a, stay on the that mic. <laughs> It, it, it's a DOA, you know. I know. But you trying keep, to impeach You keep her turning your head away from the mic. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And and then when my mouth is the other way, it's not the same. Right. Yeah. Cuz you're Yeah, you're talking in the opposite direction. You know, Dead Fellow has had the same critique with me with recording my vocals. Cuz you said, <laughs> you know, when you're recording your vocals and you're singing, you need to keep your mouth by the microphone the yes. whole time. Turns out, it turns out. Yeah. No. Which, uh, you know, this this thing here, these headphones, actually come with a microphone attachment that goes out Right in front of your mouth, you know, like a motivational speaker. Right. Uh, but I don't like it. I don't like it. You know, I, I would rather have one of those Bob Barker Price is Right type microphones where it's only like a half inch wide, but it's like two feet long. Yeah. That would be awesome. I would love to have one of those. I was actually thinking about potentially getting a lapel mic. Yes. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. You got to get one of those Marv Albert, yes, <laughs> lapel pin mics. Um, did you bite her? Yes. Yeah. Or one did of those. Did it leave marks? Yes. <laughs> or one of those did Bob Barker lollipop microphones. Yeah. Remember when Marv Albert got uh, tied up in. I do. Uh, yeah. I do. Because he was actually on. Was it? He went on Letterman. It was either like right before or right after it happened. Uh -huh. uh, and it was like they were. Yeah, his mea culpa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was pretty good. And they actually took him off the broadcast. He wasn't mm -hmm. doing it for a while. And all of a sudden, about a year or two later, he's back on TNT. And next thing you know, it's like it never happened. Yep. Yeah. And his uh, his brother uh, Trevor, uh, just like he was actually the beneficiary of all of the the bad publicity, because he mm -hmm. just kept doing his thing and kept his head down. He's like, no, and, and I mean, he's my brother, but we don't need to talk about that. And just kept going, and he was fine. Yeah, turns out a lot of these people. That are put up on a pedestal. Um, well, they're actually perverts. Yep. They're kind of perverted. Yep. That's why they're put um, on a pedestal. Because uh, they can be leveraged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what most well, people you know, don't understand about being a celebrity. Is the only way that you're going to get to a status of like 
a Brad Pitt or a Tom Cruise or an Angelina Jolie or somebody like that is if you compromise yourself enough times along the way. That's the only way you're going to get there. And you have to obey your handler. Mm-hmm. Ask Kanye. Well, that's I'm sorry, part his of trainer. Compromising his yourself. trainer. I'm sorry, his yeah. trainer. <laughs> We'll just call him an engineer. That's that's good enough. But, you know, it, it, it's really remarkable how far we've come from Edmund Bernays and Madison Avenue and, you know, Liberty Torches for the Women and, and the whole birth <laughs> of modern propaganda to the opening of the Laurel Canyon Studios uh, in California, where the War Department, now Department of Defense, began producing so many movies and propaganda films. Uh, a lot of the films that we've seen, including the footage that I used for my music video for the song World War Three: Save Our Economy, where it's got all the footage of... Uh, alleged nuclear tests blowing down buildings and everything. And, you know, when you watch those videos over and over and over again, you begin to notice things. It's like right before the explosion at the house, there was no car parked next to it. Then when the explosion happens, there's a car parked right next to it. Well, that's weird. Well, how did that happen in the same camera shot? So that, that car just, whoop, the explosion of the nuclear stuff caused the car to materialize right? as the car vanished. And so, and then you notice like, in a it few was bending of the shots, space and time. The smoke is too big and the buildings seem like, it seems like, like special effects filming for a Godzilla movie where mm. it's not really a Godzilla in Tokyo. It's a miniature Tokyo and a Japanese dude that's actually only three foot eleven wearing a Godzilla suit. Okay, Joe Stomping Biden. Stomping on the toy building. <laughs> and um yeah, <laughs> so it turns out some of the nuclear tests may have been slightly over exaggerated at to be fair uh mm. at worst they were totally fucking made up but you know um things like that um practice moon landings because of course the real moon landing was totally real <sniffs> um but whatever so uh, so many of these famous movies and films and things that that we've seen throughout time from beginning in the 1950s up to about the late 70s they all came from america's most prolific motion Mm. picture studio to ever operate producing more films than all other studios combined still to this day Mm -hmm. laurel canyon studios and yeah look out maryland yeah marilyn monroe ronald Mm -hmm. reagan Walt um, Disney, Jim Stewart, Walt Disney, yeah, on, on, on. Um, one thing to look forward to, folks, here that that peruse the Rockfin type um, websites. Uh, I've done a couple of uh, movie watch-alongs in the Mystery Science Theater three thousand type vibe there, MST three thousand vibe, where I kind of Beavis and Butthead along with my sis, uh, occult priestess. Uh, watching old movies, and and we've done Break New World, we've done Soylent Green, and one other one. But the next one that we're going to do, we're we're trying to pick out our favorite selection, our favorite uh, movie from Laurel Canyon Productions hmm. to do a watch along. So be on the lookout for that on the Occult Priestess. Rockfin channel. We uh, uh, we've got it down to a short list, and so I've got to watch more, and she's got to watch more, and then we're gonna see which one we agree upon. Uh, which movie that was produced by Laurel Canyon, Lookout Mountain, and uh, that that we're then gonna fucking crack jokes on and mm-hmm. uh, 
make fun of for the entire time it's playing. You know, like kind of like Beavis and Butthead making fun of music videos and shit. Yeah. That's that something that we do on occasion. It, it is. It's you know, if you, I, I highly recommend people go check out Occult Priestess's channel. She's had some fire content. She did a major show on um, uh, what's the British uh, Messiah dude's name? The Second Coming of Jesus Christ. What, uh, Russell Brand. Yeah. Oh, oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The Messiah. Well, that was one of his <laughs> movies too. Um, uh, was it? Yeah. Remember? Which one? Russell Brand and the Messiah. I don't remember him as the Messiah in anything. No, it was like him going around like as a guru, as a fake guru in that movie. I don't know. I honestly didn't watch a lot of yeah. Russell Brand's movies. I never honestly thought he was whenever that I good play, of an actor. Whenever I play Trivial Pursuit, the hardest pie wedge for me to get is always movies. I, I, I really? That that's my Achilles heel. That that's what gets me every time. And they're like, "What movie did Cary Grant star in in 1952 with Ethel Merman?" <laughs> Fuck if I know. You know, I've <laughs> never been much of a movie buff like that. I, you know, there's some movies, but God, it's been so so long since I watched a movie, and there's been more movies coming out lately, and. You know, we could even cover and review some movies, but why? Why? Yeah. There's, there's so many other things I could waste my time with, like just constantly yeah. getting high and making music. So I don't really have much time for the propaganda. But the the point I started at before this long ramble just completely evolved was the fact that we've seen the in, what I would consider to be the invention of modern propaganda, where this American monoculture was crafted by the minds of Madison Avenue. I mean, so many of the cultural icons that we associate with Americana today, like Santa Claus in his red suit. Mm -hmm. You can thank Coca-Cola for that. What we think of Santa Claus today is, was created by Coca-Cola, believe it or not. So, you know, I mean, it, again, it's Madison Avenue through iconography and narrative and storytelling and the it's news created you know it's it's really created such a loyal following it's such a deep part of the american uh, psyche now associating different icons to the point that let's say most kids today can identify icons quicker than they can actual letters of the alphabet oh that's the nike swoop you know oh, that, that's the ea sports logo or, or whatever the case may be for the icons symbols um it just goes to show the the ever-increasing power of advertising and people are sick of it who likes ads i mean would there be ad blockers if everybody loved ads you know what i'm saying it's, that's a good so, point uh and it's a constant struggle to reduce the number of ads in my life um and of course in the public spaces in the United States in particular, everywhere you look, there's buildings mm -hmm. and ads. On the buses, on the benches, on the buildings, on the signs. I mean, you're just bombarded with fucking advertising everywhere. That's what I miss about Latin America. Mm -hmm. you know, in the United States, you look up and, and you see electric poles and lamps and just billboards and advertising everywhere. And in Latin America, you look up and you see electric poles and just rat's nests of fucking wires <laughs> from every pole. You're like, is that safe? Sometimes that they're safe? just and hanging then, down. <laughs> and like every other fucking pole is sparking and some houses have lights, some houses are dark, some of them it's kind of strobing on and off. You know? But the food's great. But the food's great. <laughs> The food is good. The food is really, really good. Um, like I said, that's that's one of the things that I'm going to miss the most, is the food. It's so damn good, and it's so cheap. Oh my god, it's so cheap down here. 
Mm. And it's real food. And and of course, mm-hmm. Mexico really not cool with the bioengineered GMO type foodsy foods. No. Well, they're already um the the population is already getting decimated by the uh the corn syrup and uh all the extra sugars that they're loading into the foods and the drinks. Because unfortunately Mexicans have fallen in love with Walmart. Mm-hmm. Spoiler alert. There are Walmart stores yep. all over Mexico and all 33 states. There's so many goddamn mm-hmm. McDonald's and Walmart and busy. in Mexico. You, you'd you honestly think you're still in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the United States in the 1980s. With Walmarts everywhere. Yeah. That's that's kind of what it's yeah. like. Wow. Perfect description. Yeah. Yeah, because they, they still haven't put in, like, the newer types of uh, infrastructure that some of the cities in the United States have. Um, but, yeah, it's not... Mexico's not far off from what most folks experience in the United States, or at least it's not far off from what I experienced. You know, again, living 20 minutes outside of D.C. I think, you know, other than Mexico City, it's a great place. Mm. I would agree. Mexico City, on the other hand, mm, totally fucked. From what I hear, yeah. Right? Yeah. Fucked. I mean, it, so much land subsidence, water issues, wastewater, sewage issues, um, volcanoes, earthquakes, mm-hmm. air pollution, overpopulation, terrible traffic. Um, um, well, in, in Mexico, they're called Chilongos. Those mm-hmm. poor, poor I know. I them. mean, by some metrics, Mexico City is the largest city on earth by population and density. I by, believe by it. some metrics. By some metrics. It's it's staggering how many people are in Mexico City. I mean I I know when we landed because we had to fly from uh we flew from Corzo de Chiapas into uh Mexico City Airport there. Oh and then wow. We had to transfer planes to our uh, Delta flight from uh, Mexico City to Atlanta Hartsfield International, where we then transferred to our puddle jumper that seated six people with propellers, and it completed our journey from Atlanta to West my God, Virginia. Um, hmm. But it was the flight from Corzo to Chiapas into um, Ciudad Mexico when we landed at the big ass airport there uh, they've got all these places like where they like if an airplane died on the air on the runway and they painted the white line around it you know they've got these special parking places for airplanes all around the, the boundary fence of the mm. airport where planes will just go over there and park and then they bring out the stairs and you walk down on the fucking tarmac at the end of the runway by a fence that's right by a fucking Mexican expressway and you get on a bus and then this bus then has to weave in between landing planes, parked planes and all this shit and after about a 20 or 30 minute transit, you're finally at the terminal building. But not at the actual passenger terminal building. You're at the bus terminal for the runways that serve the airport terminal. And so you go in there and it's like, because they've got like 20, 30 different, a fleet of about 30 buses Good that Lord. are ferrying passengers to and from the overflow flights that park on the edge of the runway. And that's what they do with all their flights coming in from like Chilpancingo, Oaxaca, Michoacan, Corzo, Sinaloa, mm. you know. And then for the 
big flights, you know, coming from like Monterey or Cancun or international flights. Well, they they actually get to dock at the passenger terminal and a little thing comes over to the door. They never have to walk on the tarmac. They just walk right into the terminal. Because, you know, that's how it was when we boarded our Delta flight to Atlanta. It uh, sounds yeah. a lot like they how they did uh, the layout with Dulles when they added uh-huh. the, uh, the was it second terminal or third terminal? I don't remember. Third terminal. Yeah. And, and you got to fucking get ferried all the way out there on a goddamn bus. Yeah. Fucking bullshit. Yeah. It's retarded. They did the same thing to us at the Palermo airport. No, mm-hmm. not Palermo. Barcelona. Fucking, yeah, because our, our flight from Barcelona to Palermo, we had to get on a fucking tram bus and go all the way to the far end of the goddamn runway to get on our plane to Palermo uh, because the plane they had actually was pulled into the terminal and docked. But there were some unauthorized personnel that had been on the plane. Uh-oh. And there were some unauthorized personnel on the maintenance crew or whatever. And they didn't like the way things were. And there were some very important people on the flight going back to Palermo, Sicily with us from Spain. Mom, um, probably. And so they just found another plane real quick and put us on that plane and sent us. Because I, I guess the Poor guy was so paranoid, you know. Hmm. Which is probably good. You know, I would not want to die on a plane that was blown up because I was riding next to a mobster. That would suck. I don't know. I figure if that's the way you go, you probably had a pretty good run. Well, yeah. I mean, there's worse things that could happen, yeah. you know. I mean, I, I, mean uh, you know. I don't know. Honestly, like, if I got to choose... I don't know. I might pick that. I mean, like how yeah. how quick? How much of the uh, the blast and and the the falling out of the sky and the wreckage when you hit the ground? How much of that do I actually have to experience? Because if it's not a lot, I might I might go that way. That's a far more pleasant death than dying of hypothermia, being saran wrapped to a utility pole in Ukraine <laughs> because you're not Nazi enough. Which brings me to the subject of Canada. <laughs> I've been holding back all this time, but but I did tentatively call this episode to uh, get back harder with Colonel Drizzle and Major High Yona. What the Canuck, man? Yeah. What the Canuck? Jizzed in turd hole, Canada's first black prime minister has completely, he's just completely fucking lost the plot at this point. Um, Canada is the laughing stock of the world. They've actually outdone the United States for a change. I know. And this shit with the Sikh leader and then the whole Yaroslav Hunka five-minute long standing ovation mm-hmm. because Yaroslav Hunka was in the Waffen SS division. Mm-hmm. The yeah, because he fought the Russians. He's, and uh... the Americans and the British. <laughs> <laughs> And Canadians. Nazis fought Did Canadians he? too, man. At D Day. Yeah. Yeah. Canadians died on the Normandy and beaches. Killed by Nazis. Well, I mean, see, that's the problem right there is Trudeau is not Canadian, he's Cuban. That's right. So he doesn't he doesn't care. Doesn't care at all. No skin in that game. No. Not at all. Um, I, I did see, I think it was today that Trudeau was saying that it was the media that was blowing this all out of proportion and it was just a simple mistake. He he didn't know. He didn't know any better at the time and it was just, it's in the past it's it's over and done with now and it's just the media that wants to make a big thing out of it you know after this row happened after this embarrassment happened trudeau goes back onto the floor of the legislature 
and starts talking about, well, the conservatives hang out with people with Nazi flags and Confederate flags all the time, to, and immediately to booze and tears. Like, he has absolutely no shame. I mean, you know, it, it reminds me of the moment when the McCarthy era, the first McCarthy era, came to a screeching halt. I, mean, I speak of Senator Joe McCarthy, who really pioneered the whole science of Russia phobia and Red Scare, and you're all fucking commie pinkos and Russian sympathizers. And that all began with Joe McCarthy, McCarthyism, and the Committee on Anti American activities and shit like that and uh it came to a point in these senate hearings where senator joe mccarthy accused pentagon generals of being closet communists and russian sympathizers at which point uh one of the other senators said uh have you no shame sir because he had gone so far over he had gone so far beyond the pale that, you know, it reached a point where everyone was laughing and snickering. Mm -hmm. And that's when McCarthyism died the first time. Luckily, McCarthyism 2.0, alive and well. Oh, yeah. Alive and well. <laughs> the Russians did it. Mm. It hadn't been for the fucking Russians. I wouldn't, have to, I wouldn't have had to drive to that pothole today. Fucking Putin out there digging potholes in my fucking... West Virginia interstates again, asshole. <laughs> Damn it. I know. Well, just think, if we weren't sending all of that money to Ukraine, we might have a couple thousand dollars to repair that pothole, Yona. Maybe. I mean, maybe not, because it is West Virginia after all. And... Isn't it convenient that Lahaina happened? Mm -hmm. Because as little as people were talking about East Palestine before that event in Hawaii, nobody's talking about East Palestine now. Yeah, it's gone from the radar. But, yeah. you know, I would like to think that there's a silver lining um, granted, it's uh, a gray, ashy silver lining around Lahaina. Um, and, and that ashy silver lining has to be the fact that I like to think this is going to bring the people of Oahu and Puerto Rico much closer together as, as they all realize they're just peripheral colonies to the empire and the mm. empire can give fuck all about them. The, the difference being that Hawaii is actually uh, a state um, and they somewhat get to manage their own affairs, mm. whereas Puerto Rico. <laughs> but we're going to cut out about five minutes of endless laughter and get to the point. Um, <laughs> yeah, Puerto Rico is still managed by one fucking banker in New York that controls all of their financial affairs. Pretty fucked up. Yeah pretty fucked up but you know what as hillary clinton used to say about iraq puerto rico is a business opportunity and so is lahaina you know what i'm saying it's, those people are going to need new housing i mean the tourists hmm. <laughs> not the natives come on anyway <laughs> but now i was gentrify thinking about me that. harder daddy <laughs> i was thinking about that today i was like but just does East Palestine just not matter anymore? Like, for crying out loud, man, the president was up in Detroit, like literally just the next state up and over from Ohio. So, motherfucker still hasn't been to East Palestine yet. Not once. Not well, once since February. Now, come on now. Rat Boy's been there. Rat Boy. That doesn't Boy. count. That does not Poot count. Booty Fudge. Poot Booty Fudge is the, uh, is the Secretary of Transportation. That's got to count for something. He's not even the Secretary of his bedroom, for crying out loud. 
And, you know, really, I think Poot Booty Fudge would be the perfect successor to Poopy Pants. Why? I have a feeling I'm really sorry I asked. (laughs) At last, we would have the deep state itself ruling in plain view. I mean, don't they already? Yeah, yeah, and and but it's congruent to go from poopy pants to poot booty fudge. Mm. Pretty much the same thing. The only thing is, poot booty fudge is doing it in assless chaps without diapers. Yeah, but he just doesn't look presidential. Like he does not have that look. Like he looks goofy. Like, even more so than W. Like, W is a goofy-looking motherfucker. Don't get me wrong. But this guy? No. He couldn't be president. Yeah, you know, it would be easier for Poot Booty Fudge to be president if he had some nepotism working in his favor like W. But the only thing he has working in his favor is the deep state. And if the deep state really does kind of make a selection process out of our so-called election process, then anything's possible, I I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, when it comes to East Palestine, it did make the news a few days ago. Uh, I saw a more recent article, and and, uh, Ryan Christian at Last American Vagabond was covering it, where the EPA admitted uh, sheepishly that they actually have dioxin experts on staff, on the payroll, just for dioxin at the EPA. And because of a <laughs> just a silly mix-up, no one ever told any of their dioxin specialists about the East Palestine accident until three months later. Uh, but they told them about it. Um, of course, they're still not doing anything about it and they're not increasing their testing regime or anything but that was the mea culpa I guess that we got from EPA after all this time um, and to me it's just flaunting they're, they're literally just laughing in our faces um, <laughs> and we didn't well, even tell our own dioxin specialists for three months and they're still not looking into it see this one wait and, and this one hmm. Two of them right in your ass. So I'm I'm guessing that this stuff just isn't getting reported on the mainstream news, right? Like they're just not talking about East Palestine. They're not talking about Lahaina. They're not telling people that anything's going on at this point, really. I mean, uh, is that why there's no uh, public outcry? Well, because that's the thing that's bothering me about it. It there's a lot of development in the election season as we build toward presidential election 2024 that demands uh more coverage. Clearly, and and then of course um, we've got the latest um, panic, which is this the 38th or the 48th government shutdown in the last 10 years? Nobody's I don't know. I think it's every single that. fucking funding cycle. It's a government shutdown, but this time it's most definitely a government shutdown. And Republican Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, despite all attempts to appease the more radical mm. Republicans, and they, he's, he's just every attempt, he just can't get it through. And now. Democrats are going to have to uh, promise out more tightened border security to get a vote to, you know, try and make the government shutdown not last as long because now there's definitely going to be a government shutdown. The only question is how long, and they're still trying to hammer out a deal. And I mean, but don't worry, you, folks. You really, we can still get money to Ukraine. All right. You know. When they talk about government shutdown, it's just about, well, they'll shut down the national parks, anything that the public uses. None of their shit is shut down. They can shut down the TSA. That'd be fine. 
oh, they'll never do that. But and so you know, again, this whole thing with the nonstop breathless coverage of the current in looming and definitely going to happen for at least a few day government shutdown. This being the at least the fortieth iteration in ten years, it just seems to me like they've they're using the same playbook, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And and how can the propaganda just keep getting worse? And and maybe it it's it maybe it isn't that the propaganda is getting that much worse. Maybe you think it's people that, are getting dumber. I think at least in terms of our awareness. And, you know, going through the trivium, using logic, using facts, examining the receipts as they go along, mm. week by week, day by day. I would like to think it, a lot of it has to do with simply, you know, our raising awareness, our raising levels of awareness of the propaganda and our constant deconstructing of the propaganda, because you know, and it. It's like that guy you don't want to watch a movie with who's giving away. Aha, I see the strings in that thing. You could see the strings attached to that airplane. Or, you know, somebody that's just ruining it for you, all the special effects. And mm -hmm. to me, that's kind of like the grand theft world in the propaganda realm. You know, we ruin it for everybody else, all these special effects they're doing to manufacture your reality. And, and this is actually how they're doing it. And this is actually what they're doing. And it's all bullshit. And, and, you know, and once you learn it, once you see it, once you learn to see it, you can't unsee it. And and maybe that's it. You know, maybe they're, no, no, actually their propaganda is getting worse. It, oh, yeah, just, it's definitely getting worse. But because, I mean, I guess it comes to a point where they're just like, fuck it. We're going to kill all you bastards anyway. And well, there'll come a point when they'll just stop pretending. That's the thing, though, anyway. is uh, that's We're kind, kind of, of what there. I've been thinking lately as well. We're just at a point where they realize it, it just doesn't it doesn't matter anymore. We can just let whatever go because pretty soon it's not going to matter anyway. Yeah. But what's the pretty soon? Like, wh what is that? What does it look like? And and why do they know that it's going to be soon? Well, for one thing, to me, it's beyond the pale to expect the country to accept the unconditional re-election of Joe Biden despite any number of varying factors or candidates regardless of whatever outcomes, if they're just bound and determined to just reinstall militarily, once again, the Biden-Harris regime, I just don't see that flying. I, I, I don't, don't see that see happening. I don't even see it happening. In fact, for me, it seems a much more likely outcome, considering the way they've been telegraphing the past in the mainstream media. Uh, and the way that even CNN and MSNBC are now shitting on Biden. He's going to, I don't see him lasting. I don't see Biden on the ticket in 2024. I don't know. I don't, I They're don't gonna see him uh, anywhere in 2024. Like he's not going to be in the picture. No. If I had to guess, and, you know, this is awfully early out. We'll move on from the playing with dolls and action figures and politics and puppets. But if mm -hmm. I had to guess who the race is going to be against uh, next November, I'm going to say it's going to be run. Uh, it's going to be Florida governor run to Satan versus um, California governor Navin Grusom. Grusom mm -hmm. versus to Satan. But uh, Newsom already said he's uh, he's not trying to run for president, and DeSantis is currently floundering. So how how are we pulling those two rabbits out of the hat? How's that going to uh, happen? Well, because uh, right DeSantis now DeSantis the most has popular the, the 
you know, and when you've got Masada on your side, those are the kind of friends that matter. Just ask Jerry, uh, Jeffrey Epstein. Um, and, you know, when it comes to the other side of the ticket, Nab and Gruesome, he can say what he wants. I've seen his embossed, textured American Psycho business cards, full color. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's going for it. He's going for it. And and he might just drop a cloth and kill you with a pound and a half upholstery hammer because it takes more swings. He's that kind of psycho. Nab and gruesome. <laughs> so. That's why they call it California. Are they going to do like some sort of Nixon Agnew thing? To get rid of Kamala? Because Joe's got to go. Joe's a problem. All right. Joe has to go. One way or another, it doesn't matter how it happens. Joe is a liability now. So he's got to go. Well, but, to me, the real story of this election is going to be the <laughs> third party candidates. How many votes is Nick Brana going to get? Are they even on the ballot in any states? How, what happened to movement for a people's party and Nick Brona? A movement for the people's party. Um, I guess it's a bowel movement and they're constipated. Um, check yep. it out on the uh, Panquake with Susie Dawson whenever that's up and running. Um, so uh, <laughs> I, I couldn't resist. So and then and maybe uh, I also heard maybe Wobbly Bobbly uh, RFK Jr. might run as a libertarian. Take that, Democrats. And, and we thought, could get corn. We could get Cornell Pop as the Green Party candidate. Remember nope. what Joe Biden said: Cornell Pop was a bad dude. Nope, he'll never get on the ballot. Never. They won't let it happen. They won't even let uh, a third party on. They're not going to let a fourth and a fifth. What? What is this? Great Britain? No. No, there's two. Guess, you get really, two. We're really not. There's not going to be any Democratic caucus to rise this election season. Why? Why? Why do we need yeah. to do that when they can just say, "Here, this is your choice." Be because if you truly believe in the primary system, why wouldn't you also be a caucus sucker? Hmm. Speaking of <laughs> caucus suckers, uh, that was an excellent segue. Did <laughs> you happen to see, Yona, what a judge in New York today did to the, uh, the Trump empire? Oh, no. Fill me in. I, I heard right. whispers about this earlier in the day. So, breaking news, folks. Well, it's, I don't know how breaking it is. Let me see. I'm actually going to go over here to my source, uh, which I think most folks now that I, my main source is Zero Hedge. That's fine. Let's see if I can find it. More woes for the dick of Cheetos. Poor guy. His legal Let's woes see. are huge. Yeah, it was uh, it was an interesting ruling. I'm trying to remember what time of day it was that I saw it. It was there. We go. I found it. So the headline is Trump rages at deranged New York judges' corporate death penalty decision. Wow, that was a mouthful. Wow. Yeah. All right. Corporate so, death penalty. All right. In a stunning decision on Tuesday, <clears throat> excuse me, a New York state judge found with no trial or jury that Donald Trump, his family and his business, the Trump organization was liable for fraud and ordered what experts in New York financial crimes say amounts to the dissolution of his company. Essentially, uh, let's see, where is it here? Yeah. 
ordered the judge ordered uh he rev- he revoked the New York business certificates belonging to the Trump organization saying you can no longer do business in New York all right by anything run by Trump or his family it's all gone all been revoked marked out torn up thrown away whatever you want to say and he also ordered an independent third party to be tasked with managing the dissolution of the canceled LLCs. Wow. Yeah. That's so, heavy. So, so in other words, I'm not going to be able to... Com- I, I- I cannot complete my degree program with Trump University, New York campus. No. And here's the kicker. It what about, this all has to be Trump, done. This all no has more to New be York done. Trump stakes? No. And this has the process has to be finished in ten days. That's impossible. That's impossible to manage. That yeah. that's just ridiculous. That 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 with, with with any amount of legal team, he ought to be able to get that. Just that that's just ridiculous. I've never heard of that. I haven't either. I that, believe it was really... uh, a first of its kind ruling. But you know, this is the same New York State that brought charges against Trump in New York Manhattan State District Court saying that he violated federal election laws and that New York State was going to go after him for violating federal election laws that the federal government is not going after him for. But since when does the state deal with the enforcement of federal law? That's not even in their jurisdiction. Um, And so, you know, there's been a lot of hoopla made about a number of these indictments against Trump many of which are, if you actually go and read it, are just ludicrous. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, it makes a mockery of the justice system because there are actually ample number of crimes and swindles that Trump is indeed guilty of. And they never seem to go after him for any of that shit. Nope. Um, And so it's, it, it just seems like Kabuki Theater at Spinal Tap Volume 11. You know, and just the most hyperbolic delivery. Um, you know, I mean, there are some definite, you know, there are some things that are giving me, uh, there are some developments here that are giving me quite a bit of hope. Um, and, and that is in the fact that we've seen repeated, uh, financial pain being brought to different uh, companies now that have taken the ESG or taken Mm -hmm. different social agendas. Probably the most notable example would be, you know, with Anheuser-Busch and Bud Light and the Dylan Mulvaney um, fiasco, uh, basically committing Hari Kari to their own brand. Um, And the real story for that, to me, is in that so many consumers now have really began to start to grasp what power they have as a block of consumers and buyers, and like in the case of Bud Light with beer drinkers. Um, and it's had such an effect that it's not, um, and Heiser Bush out of the number one position. But, but of course, you know, if, if you do a little bit of digging, you'll find out that InBev owns all the goddamn brands anyway. So, you know, when Corona overtakes Budweiser, still making InBev, InBev money because you know, they own Modelo brands and they own fucking Anheuser Bush. So, you know, I mean, that's the nature of all these global multinational corporations. Um, you know, I've had some several good conversations today on the phone with Ted Bella and some other friends overseas. And the topic keeps coming back to what is the future 
told, you know, are we already in World War III? What's going to be the outcome? And that's been the topic all day long in my other conversations. And I keep coming back to the fact that I think that the new center of power, culture, and influence in the world is going to be moved to the global south for the first time and since, I mean, at least Egyptian times, um, if ever. Uh, I say this, I'm talking about China, India, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, Philippines, Japan, Korea, you know, Southeast Asia. Um, if things continue on their current track with declining fertility rates in the Western countries where vaccination rates were the highest, totally unrelated, totally unrelated, um, you know, there's going to be an existential threat. In, because, I mean, already there are more Chinese and Indians put together than the entire Western world, just in terms of headcount. Um, and it's going to become far more pronounced if we see these just absolute hockey stick graph declining fertility rates in the United States and England and France and elsewhere. Some countries worse than others, but you know, ask Japan what happens when your birth rate completely crashes. You know, and I'm, by the way, I awesome uh, interview with uh, the lead singer of uh, Kodomo-san. Ah, yes, the honor. Oh, thank you. Title for children. Um, I don't know that he's really... the lead singer, though. I don't know if there is necessarily a lead singer because there's three songwriters in the band. It's a so, group effort. It's yeah. a group effort. Yeah. But it was really cool to hear a different side of uh, James Corbett <laughs> in that interview. Because, um, you know, we always hear his takes, geopolitical takes and stuff, which I love. Don't get me wrong. It was just really cool and interesting in that interview to hear other sides of James and, and, and to get into the music and stuff like that. I just, I yeah, just wanted to... I to throw that I out. Think I think that that was, um, and I appreciate that, um, but I think that was why he agreed to do it because I actually, that was how I pitched the interview to him. I was like, hey, look, we could, instead of talking about like the stuff that you always talk about, you know, we could focus more on the band and the music. So, yeah. and it was super like I said, cool. I had a lot of fun, a lot of fun talking to him. You know, I would love to see you do uh, an interview with uh, Ryan Christian at Hmm. The Last American Vagabond uh, and, you know, uh, probe him deeper for, you know, what what his favorite songs, because he's a musician, you know, he's got Mm -hmm. Money Game and several other tracks that are really good that he's put out. and you know to you know kind of do something similar but not the same as with corbett you know um asking ryan about his music and what he plans to do more with music and any plans for future albums uh but then also to to ask him you know because he's a master chef just like Mm -hmm. uh craig pasta jardula master chef um and ask him you know what's your favorite food to cook or is there any recipe you would recommend? You know, again, it, to me, th- that approach to your interviews is, is really cool. It, it just humanizes these, um, you know, top notch journalists or entertainers in a, in a much more human way, you know, finding out you know, the other things that, that people do in their lives. To, and, 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 you know, a lot of us content creators have our, fingers and all kinds of different things um you know so it, it, it's just really cool for me because you know there, there comes a point in time when i don't want to watch yet another show i don't want to see yet another interview talking about russell brand or the world economic forum or anything not that it's not important not that these issues aren't relevant to the times but there, there does come a point where you reach like story fatigue mm-hmm 
and you'd like to hear some other cool shit about people that you follow and like and and that's where grand theft world liberty radio steps in to fill that gap and and keep the masses entertained and informed and interested keep those viewers interested and uh well, here you know, we bring the facts so hard that you have to put your back into it that's why it's yeah. get fact harder with colonel drizzle and major iona well part of the reason why the mainstream propaganda is as successful as it is is because they are only presenting a single view of whatever it is that they're talking about right and they're uniform across their entire spectrum in that view that is being presented so again like you were saying the way to uh, demystify things is to look at it from all different sorts of angles and i don't know for my way of thinking like people are so used to um interacting with the people that they see on screens in a very particular way right and Mm -hmm. to me it's almost uh, a dehumanizing way because there's a lot of projection that happens um on the part of the viewer right so Mm -hmm. to to kind of um you know help facilitate that uh perspective hopefully falling to the wayside at some point or at least lessening it it seems to me it makes sense to understand these people that we normally only see in one particular context to understand Mm -hmm. them as a human being, you know, somebody who has multiple interests, multiple talents, multiple skills. And just because we see them uh, in one particular way, all of the time that we see them, you know, it doesn't exclude them from being able to do other things, even though we don't normally see or hear about those things. So, um, I don't know. Uh, I think it helps to provide uh, perspective. You know, I mean, imagine how humanizing it would be if you could interview President Joe Biden and just talk about shuffleboarding and badminton, you know, badminton and shuffleboard and going to the beach house and hairy you legs. Know? Um, you know, something where you can just kind of, you know, get Joe in the mood to where you can just set him off and let him start ripping, you know. Oh, I love it when Joe starts ripping, man. Give us something right off the seat of your pants, Joe. Just start ripping. And, of course, the last time he started riffing, He was actually answering a question. I think it was in Vietnam. And they literally, yeah, he was in Vietnam. Uh, Joe Biden's in Vietnam. They ask him a question. He starts answering. And um, uh, KJP, uh, Karine Jean-Pierre, and and the other handlers, they're like, press conference over, press conference over. And they they played him out with fucking jazz music. He got the fucking Oscar treatment. And they drowned him out, but like, when I was watching the segment, he answered the whole question and they like did their very best to try to isolate the audio to get his rambling ass answer. And he was, cause he was, you know, he was riffing, man. He, he was on a guitar. He, you know what I'm saying? He was on the whammy pedal. He was playing with the fucking <laughs> glass slide. He was riffing hard, dude. It's like that time when he was talking about, you know, the kids and they get on the internet and they want to find out if the aliens are real. And, you know, like, Man, there's been some really good moments where, you know, or that time when he goes, why, 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 why are you so nervous, man? You know, I mean, we've had some great Joe moments. Great. Yeah. Well, we've also had some forgettable Joe moments as well. You know, like his, his para Hitler speeches. Yeah. Like where he, oh. Like, I don't even know how to describe like the the authoritarian Joe Biden. 
Like it is kind of terrifying, right? Because it's Brandon, really man. intense. Dark and like, Brandon is a real thing, man. Yeah, it looks like he he's living whatever it is that he's feeling while he's talking. Of course, the best video I've ever seen of Joe Biden in my entire life is when he's given that speech, I think it's in Nebraska, and he's in a barn, and he's standing next to like a big John Deere combine thing. And he's talking about, we're going to have more American jobs. And, you know, right when he says, this is going to be for more American jobs, literally you can see the white bird shit splatter across his jacket. There's a fucking bird shit on him. Right when he said that, you know, really that the fact that they were able to catch that. And then when you watch the video clip, right when it happened, I mean, I don't know if it was the ESPN or whoever got a hold of that footage, but they fucking did the zoom in, the slow motion replay. You know, somebody got on the telestrator and circled where the bird shit is splattering on it and what direction it's then running down his lapel. Play by play breakdown of the bird shit splatter on Joe Biden. Um, yeah, that that to me is quite possibly some of the best sports coverage I've ever seen of a presidential mishap. Although there's been some pretty good videos I've seen of the fall up the stairs. Oh yeah, well he's done that a few times now. You know, honestly. When all is said and done 10 years, 20 years from now, the video clip that's going to remain forever of Joe Biden falling up the goddamn stairs trying to get on Air Force One. Mm -hmm. Not once, not twice, not... Poor guy. Just just climb with all four. Fucking get up there. God damn. Jeez. So, well, you you're know. assuming that we're actually going to be here 20 years from now, though. Yeah, and I don't even know if it's the same Joe Biden every time. It's not. Sometimes I look at it, I'm like, wait a second, this earlobes didn't do, that's not it. what the fuck's going on here, man? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. My favorite was oh, the man. Joe Biden that never blinks. <laughs> it's, it's so fucking bizarre, man. It's so bizarre, but. Man, I got to say, things are really looking up. You know, it, it's darkest before the dawn. And fortunately, people are getting wise to this thing. You know, I think the one video I think that's made more impact than any others that I've seen in the last 10 years has got to be when, uh, was it Sinclair Broadcasting Network or... Um, it was Matt Orphalea, I think, was the first one to put it together. Where you start off with one local affiliate mm -hmm. station talking about, you know, censorship is a threat to our democracy, right? Yeah. And then, and then he split screen into two, and then four, and then all of a sudden there's thirty two fucking screens, and they're all saying the same goddamn thing, word for word, is a threat to our democracy. Yeah, you know, and it it. It as a video in and of itself, it encapsulates the whole problem with mainstream media in that it is so manufactured, mm -hmm. it's so fake, and it's now pushed through a, a monotone megaphone nationwide throughout the United Federal State because whatever they had in mind as a United States of America under the Articles of Confederation only existed for a few years, and slowly but surely we've just been reabsorbed back into the British Empire into mm -hmm. a modern medieval system of nobles and serfs. Pretty much. Yeah. They've got yeah. medieval Openly on Openly admitted ass. now. Openly admitted. Uh, Gavin Newsom, future uh, presidential candidate uh, was talking uh, with somebody. Uh, I was watching it uh, earlier 
on uh, Jimmy Dore. They were covering it, Pasta and uh, Kurt mm-hmm. Metzger. And um, Gavin Newsom was like, yeah, we used to be a country with three classes. Now we only have two. Literally saying it out loud. We eliminated the middle class. Now we just have rich people and poor people. And so, you know, my pro tip for all you poor people out there, betroth yourself to a fine noble and it'll be great. (laughs) It'll be great. That's our English word of the night, by the way. Betroth. 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 So, uh, to, to review, Turdlich, Recibo de la Luz, and um, what's our English word? Betroth. Betroth. Betroth yeah. thine self to a fine noble, and you'll go far in this world, sir. Hitch your wagon to a wealthy star. So, are you going to be <clears throat> Team Zuckerberg, or... Uh... Team Muskrat. Aren't they supposed to fight soon? Like, what happened to that? Ooh, my money is definitely on Muskrat. Zuckerberg doesn't have a chance. Actually, I would go the other way. I think Musk is all show. Wait a second, though. If Zuckerberg grabs a hold of Musk's rug, rips off his fucking toupee, Mm -hmm. everyone sees he's bald. He could just fucking melt down and start crying and take a fetal fall. (laughs) You just don't know. know. If there's anything I know about Elon Musk, or at least I think I know, man is super fucking conscious about his hair. Super Mm -hmm. conscious. I mean, Look at those uh, pictures when he was president of PayPal. Mm -hmm. And then look Uh, at his hairline now. He was almost already completely bald. And all of a sudden now he's got a full fucking rug up there. Come on, man. Come on. And that's not Rogaine. That's a fucking weed, man. That's a fucking weed. You think it's a weave? You don't think you got implants? It could be implants. It could be a, or like some know, hair club. For honestly, type at this stuff. point, I don't know how they. I would do have it. more respect if Elon Musk just went with the receding hairline and the bald spot and wore a beanie instead. He needs to get with Tim. He needs to get with Tim Pool. Tim yeah. Pool could definitely dress out Elon in a much better wardrobe. I think. Start start uh, with the toboggan on top. I don't. I don't get, think that's how their relationship works. I think Elon's in the power position. Yeah. So yeah. The yeah. Beanie and Man Tim's can't all dictate to him. Yeah. Man, that was really something. Remember when uh, everyone packed into Tim's little RV there and they had Alex Jones and Joe Rogan and there was a bunch of them all packed up in there. Mm-hmm. And they're and they're all it's kind of like a round robin, and they're all having their say. All of a sudden, Tim Pool starts talking, <laughs> and fucking <laughs> Alex Jones, Joe Rogan, they all start shitting on him, man. They're like, you know, because because he was just doing his normal thing where he's vacillating on every issue, and well, it could be this way, it could be that way. You know, I'm kind of cool with both outcomes. You know, next topic. <laughs> don't take a position just talk about it there you go mm. <coughs> let's see yeah it really is uh, interesting in the chat you know uh el libertas is uh agreeing with me because uh zuckerberg does have jujitsu training so I think he would just, he would literally, he'd like leg sweep Elon Shit. and get him on the ground and just be done. Can we get, and he could rip off Mills the Lane in the process if he wanted we to. We got to get Mills Lane to, to Is he still to alive? Let's get it on. Oh my 
God. I would love to see a a real life celebrity death match. Oh, wouldn't that be awesome? <clears throat> oh my God! If but but I want them to do it to start like, fighting each other. I want to. I want them to do it like the Jean Claude Van Damme movie where they both have the burlap gloves on, and then they dip it in honey, and then you know then they can dip their gloves in like broken glass or you know tacks or whatever. You know, blood Was sport. That... Kumite, yeah. when he fought Tong Po. Big, big, uh, man, you know, see, that that's something I think of my dad, you know, whenever I think of those Rambo movies and Jean-Claude Van Damme movies, because that's something I would watch with my old man back in the 80s, you know, when when he used to love to wear his fanny pack. He got me my own fanny pack. and Father and son gallivanting around with fanny packs. <laughs> it's like an ass out front, but with zippers. It, it, for those of you that don't know what a fanny pack is, consider yourself lucky. I mean, you could look it up, but don't. No doubt. Just don't. How young do you have to be to not know what a fanny pack is? <laughs> I guess you, you'd have to not have lived through the 80s or the first part of the 90s, right? Don't worry, Drizzle. They're going to come back. Fanny packs are going to come back. You, you know yeah. how I know this for certain? How? Mom jeans came back. Mom jeans, Mom jeans never went out of style. Mom jeans. I mean, how else are you going to showcase the pooch? <laughs> the pooch. <laughs> Man. Nothing facts harder than mom jeans. <laughs> the only thing better than ass out back is ass out front. That's, that's, that's two shots of ass <laughs> on the same pair of legs. You get it coming and going. Right. Now available at Walmart. <laughs> You'll see her right next to the greeter. So anyway. And here's the thing about it. You know how people make videos about the strange people that go in Walmarts in the United States? Imagine, if you will, Rod Sterling. In a time and a place not that far from here. It's a place we call Mexico where they have Walmarts. And if you thought the strange things, if you thought there was strange things in the American Walmarts. I'll be right back. Go into a Mexican Walmart. That That's what's going to get you right there. Because it's. It's a freak show. And I got to say, when it comes to Walmart, it's interesting how many people shop at Walmart that hate China. And I guess they never read the labels. Most everything in Walmart's made in China, and Walmart owns Dollar Tree. And oh, there's this made in China. Man, that's kind of how Walmart goes. But uh, huh. the ironic thing to me now is, you know, when I go to Walmart to buy a pack of diapers or whatever, yeah. and I go through the fucking self-checkout to buy the fucking baby's diapers, yeah. because for some reason, despite all my protestation, I can only, that this is the only fucking style and brand of diapers I'm allowed to buy, and it's only carried at Walmart, and so, even though I hate shopping at Walmart, I end up there, so, now, when you go to pay for your merchandise in the Walmart at the self-checkout, it asks you. It thanks you? Do you just want a digital receipt emailed to oh. you? Or do you want a printed receipt printed out? It asks you that. When there's literally a motherfucker out there, the second you step around the last register into the walkway toward the door, a motherfucker's going to come running up to you and say, let me see your receipt. Mm. So why are you at Walmart? Why are you even asking me, do you want a printed receipt? When you're the motherfucker that's going to ask me for the printed receipt, five minutes after I just fucking bought it and treat me like a criminal for even frequenting your store. Why people still shop at Walmart? I don't know. I guess it's because their wife said, you can only buy this brand. So there they are. Like I. But, you know. 
Well, don't worry. I mean, it's not that much longer before they're, you're not going to have any choice because they're going to be turned into FEMA super centers. And it'll be the only game in town. That, that remember, was, remember uh, the, do you remember that moment when Brownie, Michael Brown, FEMA director, mm-hmm. was sent by George Hell w. of a job. Down, hell of a job, Brownie. He was sent down to Katrina, and then um, MTV was having that Katrina fundraiser, and it was being hosted by Austin Powers himself, Mike Myers. And that I was watching that live on MTV, and they had what was his name, um, Kurt Loader, and the other guy Norris, John Norris. And so, anyways, MTV News doing this thing, and it's Mike Myers is the host. And all of a sudden, they cut over to Kanye West. And Kanye West says, George Bush doesn't care about black people. They cut right back to Mike Myers. And he's like, what the fuck do I do? Classic TV. Live TV. I miss live TV. Mm. They didn't have a red button that they could push in time. (laughs) No. Apparently not. Or maybe they just didn't. We did get some handlers to help Kanye get his mind right. And Hmm. last I heard, Kanye got his mind right. Not saying much these days. What do you know? I guess it's that Peloton bike that his trader has him on. Could be. Peloton could be. Or maybe. Doing that to your mental state. Yeah, or maybe it's those new contracts that I heard that uh, he was mm-hmm. negotiating. Um, that might have something to do with it. Maybe. It's, um, always, it's always useful to think of your career. And um, fortunately, you know, I know that Kanye's not losing any confidence due to his extreme case of narcissism. So I think he'll be fine. I think he'll be all right. You know, as Kanye, he, he thinks himself a god, which is close to Russell Brand, who just thinks himself the son of God. Mm. So, you know, that in that in my book, that makes Russell Brand far more um, humble and modest than Kanye West. Well, we'll Look, see. I don't claim to be God. I'm just Jesus. Okay, God's my dad. We'll anyway. see because uh, now. Rumble has decided that they're going to start a free speech campaign because they feel uh, that Russell Brand, as well as themselves, I guess, have been unfairly targeted. Uh, And something must be done about it. Oh, great. So that means Rumble is going to stop fucking with Ryan's streams whenever he tries to broadcast t-lab on rumble now no no more fuckery from rumble on his stream nope nope they're they're not going to make sure that the stream for am wake out wake up goes out uh unmolested every single morning monday through friday seven to ten pacific no they're not going to do that either they are going to make sure uh, that Russell Brand gets the um, he gets the eyeballs, right? So he'll he'll get featured in the algorithm, and he'll get all of the good ads uh, attached to his videos, so that he can maximize the ad revenue. Um, and you Russell know, Brand will be fine. It, you got to look at it on the bright side. The reason why. Two Virginians like you and I can relate so well to Russell Brand is because he's a movie star and a British millionaire. Duh. Duh. <laughs> I mean, we have so much in common, you know. Mm. Being, we, we both speak English. We both like the idea of being millionaires, only that he's an actual millionaire and we're not, but we, we like the idea of being millionaires just like him. You know, we have a lot in common. 
more than you would think. <laughs> well, I think we might have to leave it there and pick it up next time because I don't know how much more ridiculous we can get. Uh, did we finish up on Canada? Because right now, I feel like Canada and Justin Trudeau are uh, really, you know, setting new bars for ridiculousness. Like, mm -hmm. trying to convince people how legitimate the Ukraine conflict is to our lives by giving a standing ovation to a Waffen SS Nazi and then having to apologize for it. And this act by Canada may end up doing more damage to the Ukraine funding efforts than anything else that's happened since 2014 and the overthrow of the Yanukovych government. Dare I say? Dare I say? Because it, it, there's no walking back what just happened with... Uh, What's his name? Uh, Yaroslav Hunka. Yeah, they don't have to walk it back. They just memory hole it. I guarantee you, four weeks from now, most people won't even remember that it happened. It'll be gone. Now, for those of you that you know think that we're looking at this all the wrong way, um, I, I'm not right all the time. Oftentimes, I you know, learn new things and change my positions. Um, it's called the Kama Sutra. So um, for those that do find a warm, warm uh, feeling of solidarity with 98-year-old veteran uh, who fought the Russians and their allies, <coughs> America and England, um, Yaroslav Hunka and his darling wife actually set up a scholarship fund and a uh, studies program at the University of Alberta. So if, if you'd like to go to school in Calgary or Calgary, <laughs> however you want to say it, fucking Canuck, um, or Edmonton has a campus as well, the University of Alberta, um, you can apply for the um, Yaroslav Hunka Waffen SS Scholarship. Um, which is a student, it, it's called the SS program because it's a student scholarship program. Not, <laughs> not to be confused with the other SS, which is what Yaroslav Hunka was actually in. I mean, you can't make this up. The SS program under the Hunko is a student scholarship program <laughs> which was started by the $30,000 donation to the University of Alberta by Yaroslav Hunka and his wife. Um, so, although this thing may blow over in a couple of weeks, you, yeah. you, you could get a fine education uh, in Alberta, Canada um, and, and apply for that uh, student scholarship. And you too could be a hunk of hunk of hunk of burning love. <laughs> The jokes just write themselves these days, Drizzle. It's very little effort put forth. Very little effort. I don't very know. Effort. And, Sometimes. And you know, it, if, if the fact that we were collaborating with Nazis wasn't, you know, strong enough, wasn't forceful enough. Collaborating? five-minute standing ovation and the guy gets up and actually does fucking Hitler salutes and then does the closed fist symbol for the SS. And then Zelensky does the closed fist SS. I'm, oh, my God. This is great, man. This is fucking great. So uh, maybe maybe this is the point that we ask this question. When, when do we start talking about the, the Nazis actually won World War II? Like, when do we have that conversation? <laughs> well, um, you know, one day, Werner von Braun is um, assembling V-2 rockets at the Panamunda Rocket Works in Poland, bombing the fuck out of England. Next thing you know, he's the first director of uh, NASA, National Aeronautics and Space Agency, and they move his ass from Poland down to the Tennessee River 
at Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama, where he starts making Saturn V rockets instead of mm-hmm. V2s, the Saturn V rocket, which is what sent the Apollo space program uh, into outer orbit and totally the moon. Totally. Allegedly. But why would you doubt that? Don't even think about it. Don't even think about it. And in fact, Americans aren't the only ones that have been on the moon. And it, has, has anybody been following the Indian space program? Mm-hmm. Shout out Narendra Modi. You know, they just had a rover on the dark side of the moon. Mm-hmm. So how do you like that, Pink Floyd? That They've been to the dark side of the moon, and the first language there was Hindi. How do you like that? Shout out BJP. Um, yeah, yeah, I think yeah, Japan even out. crashed something into the moon. That's right. They were trying to land it, but it, it crashed. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, well, to be fair, it it was flying alongside Jet Jaguar and Gamera, and Gamera brushed it with its wing. It's all right, they're, they're making another one. I think <laughs> Megalon's going to help this time, along with um, some of the other cast of characters from the Godzilla movies that we've all grown to love and adore. Mm-hmm. Um and then, of course, uh, oh, you know, that's China the has a space I program, to ask James, and they're called Tycho knots. Tycho knots. We know what cosmonauts mm-hmm. are, but do you know what a Tycho knot is? That's they're Chinese made by Tycho space travelers. Yes, <laughs> but because you know Chinese space travelers, just like Tycho toys, made in China. <laughs> <laughs> So the question you forgot to ask, um, Kodomo-san. Yeah. Well, I, no, I forgot to ask Corbett if he's seen Godzilla yet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Next time. I'll have to save that for next time. Got it. Well, you know, it would make sense because... Godzilla, I don't think I've ever seen Godzilla up around like Hokkaido or Sapporo or, you know, all the way up past Sendai and Miyagi and stuff. Normally when I see him, he's either in Tokyo, Osaka, Kyushu, or the southern parts, which is where he's at. So it would make sense. If anybody's seen Godzilla, it would have to be Corbin. Because yeah. it turns out Godzilla prefers the sunny climes of southern Japan as well. He has good taste. Or Gojira, as they call them in Japan. Mm-hmm. Gojira. Gojira. All right. You want the last word? Well, uh, folks, be sure to check out all the exciting new content being put out on YouTube at Manufacturing Reality uh, YouTube channel. And, of course, we've got ManufacturingReality.org, where uh, um, I used to write articles before I started working 150 fucking hours a week. But uh, I'm actually typing out two articles as we speak and I've got nice so many bills caught up and everything I've got time to actually do other things like you know having a life um but you know at least I was able to earn the money uh fast enough to pay the electric bill and keep the lights on um which of course in Mexico you can work hard and pay the bill and the lights still go out but they're working on it So, you know, just remember, you know, you want too much. Could you just try maybe for once to just lower your expectations? Quit asking for a raise. Quit asking for time off. And instead ask yourself, can't I work harder and longer for less? I mean, everyone else is. Let's race each other to the bottom. And that's all I've got for this edition of Get fact harder with Colonel Drizzle and Major High Yoda, because you know you have to say it that way. We keep it yummy here. Delicious is the word. You know, little little brain nuggets that 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 your your brain can chew on throughout the week, and and after you run it through the head a couple of times.